Welcome to my economics channel where I love discussing the subject but most importantly I like to make it something fun to learn. In today's episode I want to discuss something which might be a little bit more complex but I'll break it down and that is the relationship between the RBA and the big four banks in Australia. That is the ANZ, the Commonwealth Bank, NAB and Westpac. And the question is, how do these monoliths, these behemoths, and ultimately the financial system in Australia, how does all of this affect you and I? So by phrasing the question this way, it seems like they're sort of doing something to us, that we sort of have no control over what happens in the financial system, or that the financial system is something so far away, something you can't touch, something you can only look at with binoculars. But what I hope to do in this episode is sort of humanize it and make it a more interesting story and ultimately sort of peek behind the curtains, if you will. It comes down to the fact that our actions in the aggregate, they affect the banking system, the financial system. And it is this system in combination with the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, which then has to support our activities. So what do I mean? So you have the big four banks and they have to participate with the RBA in what is known as a reserve system. And this is what the reserve part of the Reserve Bank of Australia refers to. And without going into too many unnecessary details, reserves can be thought of as a closed system that represent the profitability of banks. It is a system that if you do want to be a bank in Australia or a large enough bank, you must participate in. And so it's a way of settling your transactions at the end of the day. Now it's more complex than simply happening at the end of the day, but for the sake of our model, this works. And it also helps explain the overnight interest rate, which is what we're all interested in. And so throughout the day, many activities take place within a certain bank. And at the end of the day, these must be sorted out. These must be solved using reserves. To simplify this and make this example concrete, think of two banks. In the morning, bank A has to pay bank B, but it doesn't just send the money over. These banks, they know each other well, they're going to do that at the end of the day. So it's $50, let's say at lunchtime, bank B pays the other bank $25. But once again, nothing happens. At the end of the day, that is netted out and bank A then has to pay $25 to bank B. At the end of the day, bank A is going to have a deficit of reserves, $25, and bank B will have a surplus of reserves, $25. Bank A will then borrow $25 worth of reserves from bank B to then settle its books overnight. And in that case, no bank is in surplus and no bank is in deficit. And this is what happens with banks in general. Whenever you make a payment, if it's within the same bank, no reserves ever have to move. However, it's inevitably between banks. You shop somewhere, you pay money, inevitably that involves two banks. Also, what will happen is banks will make various loans. They will make these loans first and then they'll search for the reserves after. So let's take it back to you and I. The only way you can get a loan from a bank, the only way they're willing to extend that credit over and above what they have is because they believe you're good for the money. You're able somehow to earn the money to then pay them back. If it's a new business, the way you'll earn the money is from new profits, new growth that you will deliver into the economy, which will generate money. You get paid that money and then you pay that to the bank and this will pay off the loan that the bank has extended. So what happens is when that bank extends that loan, it has a simultaneous asset and a liability. And it has an asset in the fact that that loan is money that you owe to the bank. However, the bank also has a simultaneous liability in the form of the deposit. And on your balance sheet, the opposite is the case. That deposit that the bank creates for you, that is your asset because that is money for you. That is how you spend money in the economy. And the loan then is a liability. And then what happens at the end of the day is banks will make loans, they'll extinguish loans when you pay back loans, and inevitably some banks will be in surplus and some banks will be in deficit. And this is where the really interesting mechanics come in and the overnight interest rate. The RBA has a lower bound interest rate and an upper bound interest rate. The lower bound interest rate is just over 0% and the upper bound is 0.5%. And the official overnight interest rate is 0.25%. It's in the middle. But how and why does this work? So I mentioned that banks must settle with one another at the end of every single day. So inevitably, some banks will be in surplus, some banks will be in deficit. If you're a bank and you have surplus reserves, you want to lend those out at a certain interest rate. If you're a bank in deficit because you've extended many loans throughout the day and you haven't taken in deposits, you can borrow from the RBA at 0.5%. However, because this is an upper bound, this is actually quite expensive for you. Alternatively, if you're a bank and you're in surplus, you can lend to the RBA at just over 0% interest rate. But once again, this is not a very good interest rate. So what happens is banks will exchange with each other. They don't want to involve the RBA. And so you get a win-win situation. You get supply equaling demand. So what happens is if you're a deficit bank, you want to pay as little as possible, obviously. 
and you don't want to pay the 1%. You might want to borrow at the low interest rate. However, the bank which is in surplus doesn't want to lend at that rate and it has other options for the money. Of course, it can lend to the RBA, but it can also lend to other banks. And another bank which is in deficit can offer a higher bid and then we'll get those reserves and then you're stuck borrowing from the RBA, which is exactly what you didn't want. And so this is why you get that middle zone. Banks will inevitably negotiate with one another. Another thing to keep in mind is if you're a really greedy bank and you lend at excessively high interest rates and you manage to get away with this, well, inevitably, financial flows are going to go in the other direction and you'll be a deficit bank. And then the other banks will return the favor by lending at really high interest rates. So how the reserve market works is that these banks know each other very well. And this is why there's a corridor system and it's why it's stable. And the thing is, financial flows are very chaotic, but they're also very large. There are huge movements of money happening all the time. And the banks and the RBA, they have to support this activity. But the thing is, the RBA can't just set an interest rate. It has to listen to what the market wants. If banks on aggregate are extending many loans and they're constantly going to the RBA because they're perpetually short reserves, well, it could be that the interest rate is too high and that the RBA has to lower its interest rate because it can see that banks are making many loans and this is what the economy wants. It then lowers its interest rate corridor to make borrowing cheaper to support this activity. And the opposite could also be the case. If banks perpetually have way too many reserves and they're constantly trying to lend them, it could be that money is too easy. And in fact, the RBA has to raise the interest rate because it's running the economy too hot. Maybe too many loans are being made given the economic conditions and the RBA sees that its interest rate is too low. It needs to make the process of making loans more expensive so that it's more in line with market rates. And the point is, whenever you go to the bank and you ask for a loan or you want to do any sort of banking activity. In the aggregate, this all adds up to the activity in the economy. And all of these activities join together to make a market rate of interest, which the RBA then must support. Otherwise, it could have an interest rate that's too low or an interest rate that's too high. And this is the sense in which our activities, they affect the financial system and they affect the big four banks. And then in turn with the RBA, assuming it's doing its job correctly, they affect our lives. So let's make this a bit more concrete. Let's say you want to start a new business. You don't know what the macro economy is. You just observe prices. You observe general conditions in the economy and you're not modeling the economy in the same way that the RBA or a bank would do. So you've done all the modeling you can. You've done all the forecasting you can and you've come up with an interest rate that you can afford. So you then go to the bank with a business idea and you want that loan. Let's say the bank says yes, however, at a higher interest rate than what you're comfortable with. And so what do we have here? Why is our bank only giving you that loan at a higher interest rate? Why is there a mismatch between the two? The bank has come back to you and said, in fact, if we were to extend this loan to you at the interest rate that you wanted, this would actually be a mismanagement of resources in the economy. It would be too cheap. And that would then contribute to distortions in the economy somewhere down the line. And so, of course, your one business is not going to cause the problems. However, it's in the aggregate. If there are many hundreds of businesses like yours, if they were to go ahead, they would then cause problems for the economy. And this is what banks are supposed to do. They are supposed to be guardians of the resources, of the money supply, of the flow of credit. And so then the growth in the economy is not too slow on the one hand, but it's not too fast on the other hand. And this is why we have interest rates and it's why the RBA using the reserve system controls the price of money. It's what the overnight cash rate does. And so each bank's profitability in regards to its loans, that then reflects how the economy is doing overall. And that will determine whether or not you'll get that loan at the interest rate that you can afford. And this is how we get a market interest rate. And so it's everyone's actions in the aggregate, which then in concert with the banks determines the market rate. And the central bank, the RBA, is just there to support the market rate. It doesn't want to be too high. It doesn't want to restrict the use of resources or advantageous trades in the economy. And it doesn't want them too low. It doesn't want the economy overheating. And this is how the RBA and the big four banks affect your life and in turn how we affect them. And just to wrap up, the reason the RBA can run this reserve system, firstly, it's because it's a closed system. Reserves can't leak and go anywhere else, but also because the RBA has unlimited reserves. It can offer as many reserves as it likes. It can also buy back as many reserves as it likes. In this sense, the RBA is not liquidity constrained. It doesn't have a money constraint. So hopefully I broke it down for you. Hope that was easy to understand. But if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me below. Thank you for watching. Subscribe, rate, and share all the good stuff. It definitely helps my channel, and I'll see you guys next time.